aspects. So we do have a lot of people who work remotely, people who have moved from big cities, uh, kept their jobs, uh, whether they own their own business, I own my own business, or, or they are, and they've managed to be an employee that continued to work. Uh, it's a good way to move to New Hampshire, by the way, if you can kind of retain your, your uh, big city income and, and uh, pay New Hampshire expenses. It's a nice, nice arbitrage opportunity. Um, so, uh, so yeah, we, we definitely cater to that. Um, and uh, we're new, so we're, we're still working out our vibe in a lot of ways. Um, so uh, next question is, what goes on in your space that you would say is unique to your space? This might take a little bit of thought. The Keene Activist Center, I think, uh, currently holds the only record for being the only activist center to have ever been raided by uh, the police. <laughs> I think, uh, uh, so I guess that's unique. Uh, but uh, technically, it wasn't really the police. The police actually stood outside. There was a plainclothes officer who was at the stop sign across the street. The place was actually technically raided by former police detective Fred Parcells, and who is now working for the zoning uh, administration as well as a couple of other zoning bureaucrats. So there's actually uh, the fire chief, one of the fire chiefs and two zoning bureaucrats came through. Uh, Fred and this other guy had a video camera. They came in at eight in the morning and the purpose of this raid was to determine whether or not the place was a lodging house. And a lodging house has a specific legal definition in the Keene ordinances, which has something to do with a place that provides rooms for people, but doesn't provide like room service or hot meals or something like that. Like there's a very specific definition for it. And so that was kind of one of their intentions. Plus the fire chief was there and ultimately they didn't bring us up on any kind of charges for the lodging house because they couldn't prove that, uh, that claim even with the invasive raid into our privacy. Uh, and the uh, fire department did bring an issue or an ordinance violation uh, against the house, uh, technically against me, because I was the owner of the property at the time, uh, for a smoking alarm, smoke alarm violation, because apparently the city code says you have to have a smoke alarm on every floor of the house, and they all have to be interconnected. So you can't just have one of those battery-operated smoke alarms like I've always had in every house I've ever been in. No, they all have to be interconnected into some sort of system to where if one goes off, they all go off. And um, Anyway, I did some research onto that, um, and it turns out that the state statutes say that the fire chief cannot search, uh, cannot search single and dual family homes. Well, this is a single family home. So I uh, motioned to dismiss the case on that basis because essentially it was fruit of the poison tree. The idea being that if they search your pre uh, premises on false premises, uh, then any evidence they find of something that's illegal has to be thrown out. And so the judge threw that out. And uh, they then appealed to the Supreme Court on this. And it, interestingly, the Supreme Court came back and said, well, you can't appeal this, City of Keene, because you need to go to the Attorney General's office and have them approve your appeal. So you can't appeal without getting the AG's okay. And so they said, we'll give you another couple months, and you can try to get the AG to okay this. They were not successfully able to get the AG to get behind them on this, so the Keene Activist Center won in the Supreme Court. I've forgotten what the original question was. <laughs> <laughs> it was about uh, what makes it unique. Um, well, I would say yes. In the in the uh, most recent iteration of Area 23, we'll be the only activist center that will actually have a brewery up and running. So. You know, and that goes to something that I think everybody up here uh, is addressing in one way or another is that you play to your talents, whether your background is in building systems and computer programming, or whether it's in public communications, and, um, and by public I mean available to the public, not financed by the public, um, uh, and, or whether or not it's because your business partner happens to make delicious beer, then uh, you, you play to your strengths and you just sort of let that place be a manifestation of the things you enjoy and, uh, and can bring to the community. Hmm. Well, since I'm not superstitious, I will say that what's unique about my club is that I'm the only club that's been around for over a year that has not been shut down or raided. 
No, okay, uh, there's two things I actually do want to draw attention to um, on continuing the topic of scale, because I'm a software engineer, so whether it's physically, like with FSP, or technologically, I'm always about scale. Um, first off, um, I'm always encouraging people to move as close to the quill as possible, because if it makes sense to aggregate in New Hampshire, then it makes sense to aggregate in Manchester, and it makes sense to aggregate in the northwest quadrant of Manchester, and it makes sense to aggregate on my block. Please move to my block. Um, we've got probably over 50 people already who live within five blocks, I would say, of the club. Um, at least two or three buildings have been purchased by porcupines in that area, specifically because it was, it was in that neighborhood, and they filled them with porcupines, and they're making offers on more buildings now. Um, I informally call this the Porcupine Village Project. Um, and I think amazing things will happen once we reach certain tipping points of like two or three hundred people within walking distance. Like perhaps we'll finally be able to have a full-time agris restaurant, which I'm very looking forward to. Uh, the second thing is, uh, for differentiating us, is as a software engineer, I'm very committed to providing online services in addition to the physical space. Um, and it's taken some time, but I'm finally working on that full-time right now. And I'm hoping to uh, launch a bunch of exciting stuff uh, in the form of online services this year. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to present on that at the next Liberty Forum. Uh, so the Praxium. Our, I think one of our uh, unique things so far is uh, inventing our own holidays. Uh, we had un-Thanksgiving and Capitalismus. Uh, Capitalismus was an import from our New York ANCAP group where uh, you buy yourself a present, wrap it, and then open it in front of everybody. <laughs> so, uh, you're always happy with what you get. Um, so that's been fun. And that also in the scale, in the terms of Portsmouth, but not in terms of the other clubs, we are unique in just the size of our space and location. In Portsmouth, the space is really at a premium. It's you know a lot of rents have gone up to Manhattan, Brooklyn prices. So the fact that uh, my lovely wife Vanessa was there scouting and found this massive warehouse that we can you know do all all this stuff right, you know, walking distance to the West End of downtown Portsmouth. Uh, is, is unique in terms of Portsmouth, and we're really excited about that. Um, so why, can you talk a little bit about why you decided to build your space? It's motivations. I think I touched on it uh, in the first question. Activists were meeting uh, frequently at people's houses, and it's, you know, it's a messy thing, right? Like, you know, a bunch of people come in in the wintertime, they're going to track in mud, stuff like that. Um, and if you know, people want to go late with their karaoke party or whatever, then that's not going to be likely to happen at someone's house. But if it's a space that's dedicated, then that gives people more of an ability. And the Keen Activist Center is open 24-7. Uh, you know, you, if you're a member, you've got access to the building. If it's 3 in the morning, probably no one's going to be there uh, at that time you know, during the week. But if you want to go there and sit on a computer and do whatever, you certainly are welcome to do that. So providing a space for people to go and you know, a warm space for people to meet in the wintertime, uh, it, you know, a place for people to hang out on a porch in the summer, it's just, uh, it seemed like a no-brainer at that point. And I don't, I don't know if there was any other real motivation behind creating that space, except that it just seemed like it was necessary. I would say scale needing a place where you could have enough people to develop sort of a uh, critical mass to do whatever it is that you're trying to do, whether it's hold a successful class or whether it's, you know, have a movie night or uh, something along those lines. Scale's a big factor there. Um, also, at least for me, I have a wife and two kids, and there are times that I want to be outside of my house, and then there are times that I want to leave the space that I consider to be my workspace and go back to my house, because I don't want to be in the same place all the time. So those will be motivating factors for me. To provide sanctuary and to facilitate working and networking. I like that word, sanctuary. I think we're all trying to, to do that, create a safe space for, for our communities. Um, OK, uh, on a more logistical basis, how did you do it? Can you have any tips, maybe for someone who's thinking about doing the same thing uh, in their town? How to do it? Um, well, in my case, I owned the, the house at the time. It's now owned by the Shire Free Church. 
And so the tenants left who were there, and it was an open space, and so, okay, well, let's just make this the space. I mean, that was really all there was to it. There had been some upgrades and, you know, things that we changed on the inside, changed the locks uh, to an electronic lock, and, uh, and that kind of thing. So some upgrades over time. Uh, but, you know, I, I liked you talked about the sanctuary, just to go back real quick to that. One of the other purposes that I haven't touched on about the Keene Activist Center, and that sort of was the raid was all about, is that, yeah, if you are coming to Keene to visit and you need a place to crash, you can either spend eighty dollars a night on a hotel, or you can, you know, come to the KAC and give a donation, and you know, there's a bed there that you can crash in. Um, one of the things that we've changed recently is that uh, people who could stay there can't stay for a long term. So there aren't people who are, you know, like renting permanently. It's more something we wanted to purpose. Uh, to help the people that are coming to visit New Hampshire. So to have a place for people to come to where they can immediately connect with the community um, rather than just kind of hanging out in their own hotel room and not really knowing where to go and, and uh, what to do. Now they can literally plug right into kind of what is the heart of the, uh, the activist community. I know I've strayed from the question there. I'm going to have to ask what the question is. <laughs> How do you do it? How do you do it? How do you do it? I don't know. Um, I, I think something that uh, the history of Area 23 and before at the informal university shows is that sometimes perfect can be the enemy of good enough and that one thing that's really important whether you're here in New Hampshire or wherever you are is if you've got an idea that you want to get started on, the first and best thing you can do is get started on it. Because if you wait for the ideal space or you wait for just the right season, or you wait for it to stop snowing or something like that, then you're never going to get around to doing what it is that you want to do. Start doing what you want to do on the scale that you can actually do it. And you're going to make some mistakes. A lot of people think that the path to success looks like this, but really it looks a lot more like this. And as you figure things out and as you learn, adapt, overcome, and move on. I don't feel qualified to answer the question. I ran at a loss for years. Yeah. Uh, I don't really <laughs> know how to business well. Yeah, through sheer willpower. Um, don't do it unless you're really serious and you're willing to make great sacrifices, I guess would be the lesson. But you know, anything is possible if you're determined. I mean, if I can, I just... Um, One of the best things you can do is keep your overhead as low as you possibly can. I know that when we started up the old Area 23, we were in the black within 45 days. But a big part of that is because what we did was start with the lowest possible overhead. And you know the space that we're doing now, we're making a lot of changes and upgrades. Of course, we made a lot of changes and upgrades to the last space too. And what we did is we'd make a little bit of money and then we'd make some changes and upgrades. And we'd make a little bit of money and make some changes and upgrades. And we tried to do it in such a way so that if you showed up on one Friday for an event and then you came the next Friday for an event, there would be something new that you could see that we had done so that there was a sense of progress the entire time, even though there's absolutely no way we could drop the kind of cash and time into it all at once to make it actually sparkle and shine the way we wanted it to. Yeah, it's something too if I can. Um, I, I, I agree that the Keen Activist Center has been a subsidized operation in the past for quite a long time. I mean, there's, um, it's not intended, in my opinion, to be profitable. It's intended to be a place where hopefully the costs can be covered. Uh, but if not, I'm willing to cover them uh, because having that place is that important to me to have the activists having a place to go to that's affordable for them because, you know, at least out in Keene, um, you know, we don't have the people that have a lot of money out there. And so I wanted to make sure people who, you know, don't have a car can still afford to have a membership at this place. So, you know, it's 10 bucks a month to be a member at the Keene Activist Center. We don't have the large overhead that a larger space does at the same time. So that is one of the ways that we can keep costs down. But uh, I think this, it's such an important thing to do that even if you are running at a loss, it's still, it's an activist project. It's not a business. It's a, it's, it's more of a charity than, uh, than anything else. The practice team is, is viewed that way too. Um, we have three partners. I, I'll reemphasize the point that uh, if you decide to do this, um, 
try to scale back your ambitions a little bit. We, you know, we are a people of ideas, and I think we can we can quickly visualize something that, uh, in terms of day to day, is very hard to accomplish. Um, and and just having something is is better than having nothing. Um, so I think we did we did bite off what we could chew. We uh, spread the, the financial obligation over three three partners, um, and then we have members uh, that can come and use it. So. Um, we aren't expecting to turn a profit necessarily, uh, but it's it's manageable. I mean, if I look for my company, my, my contribution to the space is equivalent to what I would be paying for a separate office anyway. So we each find ways to uh, to make that make sense for our, for our own financial picture. And then there's the big time commitment, you know, get, uh, being able to get people involved. We've we've had volunteers that have made all the difference, not only in actually getting work done. But in keeping us going, because any any kind of venture like this, um, you're, you're, it's this huge thing. And then once you get into it, you know friendships are strained. Um, as you're, you're doing construction, it's all hard. So you want to have those people around that are gonna, you know, kick, even if they kick in 10%, they're gonna inspire you and say, oh, I'm doing it for these people. Um, okay. So what what lessons would you say you learned the hard way? Uh, and as a corollary, um, how do you manage people? Because you know, having a, a space means having people around, and sometimes people can be difficult. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, there have been a number of uh, lessons over time, and I mean, certainly people don't all get along. I mean, that's one of the things that, uh, that you learn once you get enough people in the same place. Uh, the New Hampshire gets criticized by the people on Facebook for being, you guys have so much drama. Well, guess what? If you get a thousand Liberty people or a thousand people of any type in one geographic area, there are going to be people who don't get along. There are going to be people who, you know, they get into a relationship and then they break up. And then, you know, like a lot of relationships that break up, they have a tough time with each other from that point forward. Or they're just two different personalities that just don't gel. And when you get people like that in the same home or in the same building, Things can get a little tricky, and you have to have uh, you have to have a way to manage that. Whether it be through some sort of mediation process, um, the the Keen Activist Center has adopted a system.